SpaceX's Starship is currently humanity's best hope for a future where we can actually live on Mars. This is a mission no other rocket or spacecraft on Earth can pull off, only Starship can, because it was built for that purpose from day one. It's the biggest rocket in the world, carries the most fuel, and powers the most advanced engines ever built. It's designed to deliver dozens of people and hundreds of tons of cargo all the way to the surface of the Red Planet. But getting there is the easy part. Landing, that's where things get hellishly difficult. And that's exactly why both SpaceX and NASA have been quietly preparing, aiming to pull off the first Starship landing on Mars before 2030. So, uh, how are they doing it? Well, to answer that question, we need to look at Starship's major missions over the next two to three years. And yes, we're talking about the Artemis lunar landing missions using the Starship HLS variant, the version NASA awarded a $2.89 billion development contract for back in April 2021. But HLS is for the moon. What does that have to do with Mars? A lot, actually. Because the Artemis missions are basically stepping stones toward future Mars expeditions. NASA makes this pretty clear on their website, with an entire master plan called the Moon to Mars Architecture. It outlines everything needed to land humans on Mars after completing at least seven core Artemis missions, from Artemis 1 to Artemis 7, a sequence that won't be finished any earlier than 2032. And the implication is simple. Before that year arrives, they'll need to send a few starships ahead of time to attempt the first Mars landings. Elon Musk even hinted at this in a past presentation, saying, But if we achieve orbital refilling in time, then we will launch the first uh, uncrewed uh, Starship to Mars at the end of next year. But that timeline is incredibly tight, and preparing for a Mars landing requires insane levels of precision. You have to simulate it hundreds, even thousands of times. Take NASA's Curiosity rover as an example. Before they pulled off that famous sky crane landing on August 6, 2012, they went absolutely wild with testing on Earth. They dropped a full sky crane system with the rover from a helicopter at tens of meters in altitude. They released a rover from a balloon 500 meters above the Nevada desert. And on top of that, they simulated the entire seven minutes of terror, both in software and with real hardware, literally thousands of times. So when the real mission happened, the landing was almost flawless. The control room went silent and then exploded with joy because they couldn't believe they actually pulled off something that crazy. Starship is going through a similar process. It's being tested right here on Earth in preparation for future Mars landings. And the clearest examples of that happened during the latest V2 Starship test flights, Flight 10 and Flight 11. In those missions, SpaceX managed to slow down a spacecraft weighing over a hundred tons from several thousand kilometers per hour to just one meter per second before splashing down in the ocean, using only one or two Raptor engines. Yes, these flights were meant to practice landing on Mechazilla, but that's not the whole story. The data they gathered is incredibly valuable for future landings on Mars as well. Why? Because the similarities are actually pretty striking. Landing on Earth and landing on Mars both require a strong heat shield system to survive the hellish temperatures during re-entry. Both need to perform the belly flop maneuver, relight their engines, and touch down under control. All of these steps are captured in SpaceX's Starship test flights, and once they have the raw data, they can use AI to simulate it under Martian conditions. Because even though the landing sequence is the same, the environments couldn't be more different. First, Landing on Earth is much easier than landing on Mars. Earth's atmosphere is almost 100 times thicker than Mars's, which means aerodynamic braking is far more effective. It's like jumping off a mountain with a parachute on Earth. The air fills your chute and slows you down smoothly. But on Mars, try that and you'll pretty much drop like a rock because the air is so thin. That's why, during re-entry on Mars, Starship has to begin firing its engines much earlier, starting from about 6 to 10 kilometers above the surface, to gradually slow down, and it needs at least six engines firing at once to create enough braking force. On Earth, one or two Raptors are enough. This also explains why Elon Musk's planned Starship version 4, the Mars-focused upgrade, is expected to have nine Raptor engines, six vacuum Raptors, and three sea-level Raptors. They simply need that extra thrust to survive entry and landing on the red planet. But hold on. Before we even talk about landing, SpaceX has to solve a much more fundamental problem. 
keeping Starship alive long enough to land in the first place. A lot of people think returning to Earth is the worst part. After all, our atmosphere is a hundred times thicker than Mars's, so it sounds like it should be far more violent. But the reality is, Mars is the one that really tries to kill your spacecraft. Here's the twist. When you're coming back to Earth from low orbit, you're moving at about 7.8 kilometers per second. You hit that thick atmosphere, it grabs onto the vehicle almost immediately. The plasma flares up. Everything heats like crazy, but it's over fast. Four, maybe six minutes later, you've burned off most of your speed. Mars, on the other hand, doesn't give you that luxury. A ship headed there from interplanetary space is screaming in at 11 to 12 kilometers per second, almost one and a half times faster. But the air is so thin, it can't slow you down. So instead of a short violent burn through the atmosphere, you end up stuck inside a glowing bubble of plasma for 12 to 15 minutes straight. Same hellfire, but it just keeps going. More speed, longer heating, thinner air, everything stacks up. The total heat load on the shield becomes enormous, and peak temperatures can climb to 2,500 to 2,700 degrees Celsius. That's hundreds to over a thousand degrees hotter than a return to Earth. And that's why the Mars version of Starship will almost certainly use a far more advanced heat shield system, something built to survive that extended torture. The Earth orbit version doesn't need anything that extreme. It just needs a shield optimized for quick turnarounds and reuse. But SpaceX will figure it out. They always do. And once Starship survives that brutal re-entry, it still has to pass the final exam if it wants to graduate the landing phase. Unlike Earth, where it can safely touch down on Mechazilla or even splash down in the ocean, Mars gives you no such luxury. There's no tower, no ships, no soft water landing. Starship has to plant its landing legs directly onto rugged, uneven Martian terrain scattered with rocks. Luckily, the Starship HLS version built for the moon already has landing legs, so the Mars version can borrow a lot of that design, with some key differences, of course. Think of it this way. On Earth, you can jump about one meter high. On the moon, you could jump six. On Mars, only about two and a half. That difference in gravity changes everything. On the moon, the soil is dry and compact. Gravity is just one-sixth of Earth's, and landers feel almost weightless. That's why the Apollo landers could sit on wide, ski-like pads and still stay stable even if they touched down a few meters off target. The surface didn't fight back, and the low gravity forgave a lot of imperfections. So, for the moon lander, a compact set of six hydraulic folding legs is more than enough. Even if the vehicle weighs around 250 tons at touchdown, each leg only has to handle roughly 70 tons of force. The moon's weak gravity makes everything easier. Mars is a completely different story. Take that same 250-ton vehicle and drop it onto a planet with nearly three times the lunar gravity. The load on each leg jumps to around 155 tons. That's more than double. And because the surface is rougher, harder, and far less forgiving than the moon, the landing legs can't just be scaled-up versions of HLS. They have to be much bigger, two to three times thicker and heavier to spread out the load and keep the ship from tipping the moment it touches down. Now, that is a lot of things that all have to go right, and there's absolutely no room for mistakes. You either score 100% on the test, or you don't come home at all. Knowing all this, it's easy to appreciate just how insanely difficult a Mars landing will be for a giant vehicle like Starship. So, if landing on legs is this tricky, wouldn't landing Starship horizontally on Mars be a brilliant idea? Could it actually work? Absolutely. Imagine the Starship still approaching Mars's surface vertically, like we've seen in test flights such as Flight 11. But this time, it uses all of its engines to slow down from 1.6 kilometers per second to just 2 or 3 meters per second. When the vehicle is about 100 meters above the surface, the RCS system, a network of 48 small thrusters distributed across the spacecraft, gradually fires tipping Starship from a 90-degree vertical stance down to roughly 30 degrees in about 10 seconds. Think of it a bit like the X-37B gliding onto a runway, except Starship is essentially building its own landing strip. A 50-centimeter thick composite landing pad deploys from the belly of the ship, cushioning the touchdown and keeping impact forces under 3G. The advantages are clear. A horizontal landing spreads the contact area over roughly 160 square meters, 
reducing the pressure to only 0.3 kilograms per square centimeter. Compare that to landing on legs, where pressures can reach 4 kilograms per square centimeter, enough to sink or even tip the vehicle on the moon's soft dust. Think of it like walking on sand. The wider you distribute your weight, the less you sink. Put all that weight on just two feet and you'll plow straight in. There's more. For astronauts, this design is far more practical. They can exit the ship via a 3-meter ladder instead of relying on a 30-meter elevator system from earlier concepts. Most importantly, a horizontally landed starship could immediately serve as a Mars base. Its 100 cubic meter interior provides instant living space. The exterior could be easily covered with a layer of regolith, blocking up to 80% of cosmic radiation. And side cargo bays allow 2.5-ton rovers to roll straight out. No cranes, no elevators needed. Now, take all those challenges and multiply them by 100. Because Musk isn't planning to land just one starship on Mars. He's talking about dozens, even hundreds. In a recent podcast with Katie Miller, he said, It needs to be sustainably multi-planetary, so not just visiting, but actually multi-planetary in the sense that you have planetary redundancy. Yeah, it sounds insane. But at least Musk isn't just dreaming. He's actually trying to reach that dream. And Starship is the core of that mission. His crazy rapid expansion tells the whole story. Within the next five years, we'll likely see at least five Starship launch pads across Florida and Texas. And honestly, that number is still small if his goal is to send millions of tons of cargo to Mars, enough to support a fully independent, self-sustaining society there. If Mars had an Earth-like ecosystem, grass, rivers, animals, that would be great. But it's just a barren world. Which means we have to adapt if we want Mars to become humanity's second home. 